yeah, yeah, yeah. Praise the Lord, yeah, praise the Lord, praise Him. Thank you, yeah, be seated if you can. Glory to God. What is the line that comes before, uh, by the uh, fury of your love? Death is swallowed up forever. Death is swallowed up forever by the fury of your love. That is, that's a line, isn't it? Death is swallowed up forever. And have you ever heard love as being furious by the fury of your love? That's what God is all about. As a matter of fact, if you don't understand the love of God, the word's not gonna make any sense to you at all. And much evil has been perpetrated on the earth in the name of God because somebody didn't understand that everything in there is filtered through love. God's emotional disposition is mercy. He is a merciful God. Out of all the religions in the world, out of all the beliefs, all the cults, all the varieties of, of philosophical and religious thought in the world, our God is the only God that presents himself as a God of mercy and a God of grace. And he wants us to understand that his natural emotional disposition is to be merciful and because of his emotional disposition, what he offers us is grace. We've been talking about grace for the last three weeks and I'm finishing up and let me just say this to the guys that are online. I know many of you guys get outlines uh, every week that we hand out here at church or make available here at church and you didn't get one today because I didn't get finished up last week. <laughs> so if you just get out the one you got last week, uh, we're gonna see if we can kind of finish this thing up today on this particular thought of understanding God's heart. And the reason this is important is because you're, you will never get closer to God than your concept of God will allow. If you consider God, if your concept of God is that he is angry, you're not gonna approach him. If your concept of God is that he's vengeful, that he's judgmental, that he's got a bat in one hand and the Ten Commandments in another and he's just looking to, for some reason to light you up, you're not going to approach a God like that. He's intimidating. A God who can do anything, a God who knows everything, a God who is everywhere all at the same time that is not merciful and gracious and forgiving. Oh my goodness. Well, let's run from that. And so many people spend their lives running from God. Many people will, will, will not come to Christ, not because they're unpersuadable about Christ, but because their concept of God is that they're not good enough, that they can't be good enough, that they don't deserve for God to do anything gracious for them. Well, I've got news for everybody who feels like that. Join the club, because that's the way we all are. What does Paul say in Romans? For all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. There is none righteous in another verse. No, not one. So you're in good company, because all of us are in the same boat. I mean, we might have all gotten here on different ships, but we're all in the same boat now because the Bible teaches us two big concepts. One is God is good. Many, many passages talk about the goodness of God and how good God is. The second thing it teaches us is that though God is good, we are not good and that we could even be considered evil in comparison to God. So there is none of us that can model goodness for each other. Your parents, bless their heart. Your brothers and sisters, your pastors, your uh, spiritual leaders, your husband, your wife. No one can model goodness for you. You will never know goodness unless God reveals goodness to you. Because goodness is actually one of the fruit of the Spirit. 
Without the fruit of the Spirit operating in your life, you'll never even see it. What for what Galatians 5 says, the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, oh, goodness, meekness, faith, and self-control, temperance. So only God can show you goodness, and only God can, uh, the Holy Spirit can birth that in your life. So those are the premises of understanding God's heart, understanding who God is and, and how he presents himself to you and, and, and what he's all about. And so last week we started on, I said, I want to give you uh, four steps to a new understanding of God's heart. And the first step was realize that your understanding of God has been shaped by your past. And it has. Your genetics, your upbringing, your experiences, your traumas in life, your joys in life, your sorrows in life, you know, your home life, uh, how your parents treated you, and so forth. All of that filters God's love. We, we all have a tendency to think of God uh, the way he's been presented to us. So the first thing is, all right, realize you're tainted by everything that's happened in your life and all the issues of your life. The second step was ask God for a fresh revelation of himself because when you look at things that happen in the world, you have more questions about God's goodness than you do answers. And most of those questions begin with the word, why? Have you ever noticed that God never answers the why questions? He never answered. We, we always ask it, why, God? Why did this happen? Why did you let this happen? Why do bad things happen to good people? And, there's, and, and God doesn't answer that question. So if you're going to evaluate the goodness of God by the experiences of life, you're going to say two plus two equals five every time, and you're going to miss God's goodness because it's not going to be presented to you in an understandable way to human nature. So you're going, to have to, you're going to have to trust God to reveal himself to you. And that brings you to number three, and that is receive from God's word a divine revelation of his goodness. God's word will show you the goodness of God, and it will convince you of God's goodness when everything around you seems to point to the opposite that he's distant, that he's indiscriminate, that he's really not involved in personal lives. Your experiences will point that way and the enemy will make sure that you notice that like a roaring lion that he is. So you must determine, do I believe the Bible is God's word? And if I do, why do I believe that? Is there a reason that I believe that? Is it just because somebody told me that it was and I've just always accepted that? Uh, why do I believe this? Because believe me, we're in the day now and we, as we go into future days from this, that belief is going to be challenged mightily. Everything in this evil, wicked, reprobate world that we're in right now is not spiraling up is spiraling down. And it gets more and more difficult. And, it, and if you don't have something to stand on, you are going to be of all men most miserable. So God uses his word to show us his goodness. And, it, and, and we have to receive it from his word by what he says. So Moses has been our example because Moses is like us. Moses is a human being who encountered God. He didn't know God. He hadn't been brought up to know God. And God encounters him at a burning bush in the backside of the desert and calls his name out of that bush and says, I want you to go down to Egypt that we just sang about, and I want you to, to deliver my people. And that's all Moses knew about God. 
Moses did more miracles than any person in the Bible. Maybe it's besides Jesus, obviously, but he, he saw the power of God more than anybody. The Red Sea standing back, water coming out of a rock, the pillar of cloud by day and the pillar of cloud fire by night, uh, 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 miracles, manna falling from heaven, uh, God defeating enemies, uh, uh, the hand and finger of God writing commandments on a stone wall. And then, and then removing them and giving them to him. So he saw all of that about God, but there was only one thing he needed, and that was even though he knew the power of God and he knew the miracles of God, he didn't know God. And he went back down to the children of Israel and saw them dancing around a golden calf and having an orgy down there, and it, it just infuriated him and he threw the commandments down and broke them into pieces and the judgment of God fell on the camp and he goes back up into the mountain again and stands before God and just, God, this is, just, uh, what is happening in here? What is, and God says, look, Moses, all right, I'm gonna, I'm gonna do what I said I'm gonna do. I'm gonna take you and those people, those stiff-necked people down there into the promised land, but I'm not gonna be in your presence. Because quite frankly, Moses, if I was in your presence, I would probably just destroy everybody. So Moses then says, God, this is, hey, if you're not with us, we're just like everybody else. The only thing that makes us distinct is you. So if you're not going, you might as well not send us because, hey, we don't have a leg to stand on. And God says, and then Moses said, God, show me your glory. And the scripture says, God spoke to Moses and says, I will make my goodness pass before you. I'll hide you in that rock because you can't see my face and live and I'm gonna let my goodness pass before you. So Moses asked God to show him his glory. And God says, I'm gonna let my goodness pass before you. Why is this? Because God's glory, his revelation of himself, his virtue that distinguishes him, his glory, like your glory is your family or your glory is your riches or your glory is your beautiful life. It's what you're known for. Your glory is what you're known for. God says, what I'm known for is my goodness. So here's my goodness. And he passes it before Moses and, and he allows us to see the seven elements that make up his glory. And it's in Exodus 34. Tan, do I have that verse up here, verses six and seven? And the Lord passed before him and proclaimed, the Lord, the Lord God, merciful. Here comes his attributes of goodness merciful and gracious, long-suffering and abounding in goodness and in truth, keeping mercy for thousands, forgiving iniquity and transgressions and sin, and by no means clearing the guilty, visiting the iniquity of the fathers upon the children and the children's children to the third and fourth generations. And the seven attributes of God is that he is merciful, that means he keeps us from getting what we deserve. He is gracious, which means he gives us what we don't deserve. And he gives us all grace, that all grace may abound to us. And we talked about mental grace and physical grace and financial grace and emotional grace and spiritual grace. And you could probably add some more graces in there. But all of that is available to us because of God's grace, that all grace is available to us. If you don't know something, ask God. He knows everything. Mental grace, you know. I won't go back down that. 
But the third attribute of God's where we stopped last week, and here it is, and, and Justin just got all over it in his prayer. And he just basically preached the point, so I'm just gonna say it and say a couple of words about it. God is long-suffering. He says, my goodness is long-suffering. It's merciful, it's gracious, and it's long-suffering. That simply means that God is willing to suffer for us for a long time and not give up and not get angry at us. Hebrews chapter 13, here's what, he, here's what he himself said. For he himself has said, I will never leave you or forsake you. On your worst day, God is your best friend. When everyone else walks away from you and forsakes you and turns their back on you, God will not walk away from you. He will stand right there with you because when God says never, he means never. When people say never, sometimes they mean, hey, until the going gets tough. And sometimes people say never and then turn around and walk away from you. But God says, when I say never, I'm never going to walk away from you, no matter what the situation is. God never changes his mind. He's not frustrated with you. You may be frustrated with yourself, but God is not frustrated with you. Because let me let you in on a little secret in case you didn't know this. The day that you got saved, God knew that he had a long-term project on his hands. He's not surprised by the fact that it's taken a lifetime to move you into some even minuscule sight of Jesus, and that's what he's doing. So he is not surprised by this. He is long-suffering. The fourth aspect of his goodness is he's, a, I mean, of his, of, his, yeah, of his goodness is he's abounding in goodness. God is good in every situation. We used to have that saying, and we've all said it a thousand times. God is good all the time, all the time. God is good. You know why we say that? Because it's true. God is good in every situation and in every circumstance. God has no bad days. God, God, God has no bad moods. If you were reared in a moody environment that lacked grace and contained a lot of judgment and maybe even seemed to be on one day and off the other, you have the tendency to think about God as being that way. But God is not moody and God is not bipolar and God is not depressed. God is always good. Jeremiah tells us about it in chapter 29. Look at it, verse 11. For I know the thoughts that I think toward you. Someone must have evidently been trying to persuade God of how God feels about things. God says, I don't need for you to tell me how I feel about this. I know how I feel about this. I know the thoughts that I have to you. And notice what he says, thoughts of peace and not of evil. That's a great thing because if he had thoughts of evil, I'm afraid we'd be crispy critters before we know it. To give you a future and a hope. Every thought that God has toward you is good. Not just when you're good, but when you're the worst, that's probably when he's at his best because God is abounding in goodness. Fifth aspect of God's goodness, abounding in truth. God never lies. God never deceives you. God never misrepresents himself to you. He's always, he's not only tells the truth, he is the truth. <laughs> Look at Matthew 24. Heaven and earth may pass away, but my words will by no means pass away. What does that mean? God never breaks a promise. 
It means what I've said is not going to pass away. I'm not going to change my mind the next day and say, uh, uh, on second thought. God is always truthful with us. I tell you, though, one thing about the Lord, that I, a characteristic that I found, and maybe it's only in my life, maybe you've never experienced this, but sometimes God will allow you to think certain ways and not challenge it. Oh, I can't explain that, but he doesn't deceive, but you have some perceptions, and a lot of times in leading you, he goes down that line. But anyway, let me give four, verse six, I mean, number six, six attribute. Let me get off that. Six attribute, for God is forgiving. This means God is always peace-seeking. Um, what, what does the scripture say? And I don't have it on the slide today. It says, Blessed, this is in the Beatitudes, obviously. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called the children of God. Blessed are the peacemakers, not the peace lovers. We all love peace. We all pray for peace. We like peace. But he doesn't say, blessed are the peace lovers, for they shall be called. And he doesn't say, blessed are the peaceable, people that don't stir the, 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 the stew and rock the boat. He doesn't say, blessed are the peaceable, for they shall be called. He said, blessed are the peacemakers, which means someone who is actively seeking to make peace. The mediator, the person that's bringing it together, the person that can't abide this uh, this critical um, evil activity of life, this separation, this disunity, this disharmony. Blessed are those who make peace, who are willing to forgive in every circumstance. And afterward, this is especially real, keep no record of wrong. Have you ever been in a discussion with somebody that you've been out of fellowship with and they just keep dragging up everything for the past 15 years that you ever did that bothered them? That's not forgiving. You're keeping a record. You have some standard that somebody has to attain before they receive your forgiveness. Do you know that one of the disciples, and I don't know who it was, it probably was John. He, Peter and John were almost opposites in their, in their natures. John was quiet and gentle, and Peter was a blunderbuss, you know, bull in a china shop. But Peter, evidently, some disciple got on Peter's nerves. And Peter comes to Jesus and says, Jesus, how often am I to forgive my brother he is on my last nerve for the last time. But if I forgive him seven times, that's certainly plentiful, right? That's gracious, right? Jesus said, no, I'm telling you, forgive him 70 times seven. In other words, Jesus is saying, always forgive him. That's forgiving. That's the forgiveness of God. Let me show you what God does. All right, Psalm 103, here it is, verses 12 through 14. As far, listen, as far as the east is from the west, so far has he removed our transgressions from us. Father, forgive my sin. Boom, as far as the east is from the west. And I know I've said this to you before, and it's redundant to tell you things I've said before because I know you remember every one of them. But the reason he used east and west is if you can picture a globe in your mind, he didn't say north and south because if you head north far enough and get to the poles, then you're headed back south. North and south run into each other. If you start east, you always head east. You never go in west. If you head west, you're always going west. You never go in east. East and west never meet. And so Jesus, or God says here in Psalm 103, I remove your sin as far as the east is from the west. As a father pities his children, so the Lord pity those, pities those who 
respect him for he knows our frame. He remembers that we are dust. You know, if we could consider one thing in the area of forgiveness, I tell you what I think would help us most of all. The scripture says that God remembers us. God remembers that we're dust. He remembers we're human. That's why he can forgive us this way. Because he pities us like a father pities his children. And if we could, and this is just a little instruction. Whenever you're out of fellowship with somebody and forgiveness is an issue, just put the shoe on the other foot. I, it is amazing to me how people do not do this. I have had counseling sessions, I couldn't even tell you how many, where somebody is out of fellowship with somebody else for something they did, and when they talked to me, I said, well, what if that happened to you? What if you were the one that this person did that and you were the one that were the offender? How would that happen? How would you feel about that? Well, that's not, yeah. We are so prone to believe that everybody should forgive us because that's not what we meant to do. But we are terribly exclusive about granting forgiveness to anybody else. But if you just put the shoe, like God does, he remembers we're dust. God's not dust. He remembers that we're dust. Put the shoe on the other foot. Anyway, here's the seventh and last attribute. God is just. God rules, and he has rules that, are, that have consequences to those of us who break those rules and to those that are around us. But even when we break the rules, God loves us and his discipline in our lives is motivated by two things. First, by how much he loves us. And I know that any parent in this room understands love like that. If you're not a parent, you probably don't grasp this like parents do. But when our children are out of line and they need to be corrected, why do we step in there and correct them? Because we love them and we want them to grow up right and we don't want them to get hurt and we don't want them to keep doing these things that are dangerous or whatever the thing might be, but it's motivated by how much we love them. And we don't enjoy disciplining. We don't enjoy, come here, boy, I've just been waiting for you. Unless we're sick, you know. Now, there are some sick people around, but unless you're sick, you don't enjoy that. But you have to do things like that because you love them. God is the same way. That's why he calls himself our heavenly father, so we can understand how he feels. And he disciplines us because, first of all, he loves us, and second of all, because it's, it, it's good for us. Whatever it is that we're being corrected for is going to hurt us or harm us in some way. Let me show you Hebrews 12. This will explain it better than I do. If you endure chastening, and everybody just say correction. That's what chastening means. If you endure chastening, God deals with you as with sons. For what son is there whom a father does not chasten? But if you are without chastening, of which all have become partakers, then you are illegitimate and not sons. Do, do you know what that's saying there? That's saying that if God doesn't correct you, you don't belong to him. If you belong to him, he's going to correct you. Let's just put it where we live. Your child and your neighbor's child are out in the yard playing. They have a big disagreement and you see it and you go out to discipline. Who are you gonna discipline? Are you gonna discipline your child? Or are you gonna discipline the neighbor's child? I'll tell you who you're gonna discipline. You're gonna discipline your child. You're gonna say, son, come here. 
come here, uh, Johnny, you got to go home. And you're going to discipline your child, and then you're going to contact your neighbor and say, hey, Johnny's done so and so, so and so, because, but his discipline's left to his parents. You may ban him from the yard, but you're not going to discipline him. Why? Because you don't discipline other people's children. God says the same thing right there. He said, look, I discipline my children. I do not discipline the devil's children. The devil disciplines his own children. I discipline my children. If you're my son, I'm going to discipline you. If I don't discipline you, it just testifies that you're not my son. Furthermore, we have had human fathers who corrected us and we paid them respect. Shall we not much more readily be in subjection to the father of spirits and live? God only disciplines his children and his discipline is always motivated by love. Now, there is justice for unbelievers. For people who are, are unbelievers, there is an eternal justice. And God will make sure in eternity that all sin and all evil is paid for. But for all believers, God is forgiving because of what Christ did for us on the cross. We have a whole period of time that I think is fastly approaching that's nothing but judgment for those who are evil and have rejected Christ and are evil in this world. It, the world is going to get its comeuppance. Make no mistake about it. These evil people that look uh, high, wide, high, and fancy, high, wide, and fancy, uh, evil uh, people that you look at and say, how in the world could God allow that? There's a comeuppance that's coming. It's a whole period called the, the tribulation. <laughs> so there is justice for unbelievers, but it's, a, it's an eternal justice, and God disciplines his children. All right. So if you see God for who he is, these are the seven attributes of God's goodness. And if you see God for who he is, it changes everything. If you can only get as close to God as your concept of God will allow, and you see God like these seven attributes describe him, I mean, there are only two of them that are, that are harsh in any way, and that's he's full of truth and, and he's just. The others are he's gracious, he's merciful, he's forgiving, he's long-suffering. <laughs> you know, there are only two out of the seven that even have any hardness in them whatsoever. So if you see God like these attributes describe him, I believe you won't be afraid to climb up in his lap and say, Daddy, I love you, and uh, you're... You know, I, I, need, I need you, Dad. I need you. I, need, I can't handle this. Daddy, can you take care of this for me? Because your concept will say, God loves me, and God, you'd never hesitate to come to God. You'd spend your life, you'd live your life on God's lap if that's the way you understood God. So what does it do to you when God reflects himself? Number, step number four, here's the last step. All right, one, realize and understand that, God sh that your past has shaped your understanding of God. Ask God for a fresh revelation of himself. Receive God's word uh, as a divine revelation of his goodness. And number four, step four, release through your life. And let me say it again. Release through your life the reflection of the change God has made in you. That means live it out. God has changed you with his goodness. It's the goodness of God, the Bible says, that draws us to repentance. It's just how good God is that makes us come to him. And so when he has changed our life, you must reflect that change so that others can be drawn to his goodness. As a matter of fact, and I'll just, I'm, I'm just going, you know, I've, I've had people lots of times tell me, man, I'm a Christian. I'll, I'll say, you, do you know I'm a Christian? Yeah, yeah. And, I, and honestly, I say to them, well, nobody could tell it by the way you're living. I'm telling you, I believe if you're saved, you live differently. 
Now, you don't live differently in order to get saved, but because you are saved, you live differently. That's just all it is to it. Uh, I, you can't convince me that if you're changed by the Holy Spirit of God and he's living inside of you, that you can just live any way you want to. That just does not compute whatsoever with anything to do with the justice of God, the chastening of God of his own children and blah, blah, and all of that stuff. So when he has changed your life, reflect that. And Moses is a perfect example because when Moses came down off the mountain, there were three things that had changed in Moses' life. Of course, three being the divine number. <laughs> That's the preacher number. We always have three of everything. All right. But here it is. Just see if you agree. All right. His worship has changed. As soon as God revealed himself to Moses, what did it do to Moses? Remember I said God did, he, didn't know, he didn't know God. God had talked to him. He had obeyed God. He had seen the power of God and so forth. But he didn't know God. He just knew about God. Now, when God shows himself to him, then Moses knows, who's God, knows who God is. And what happens immediately, chapter 34, verse 8, so Moses made haste and bowed his head toward the earth and worshiped. As far as I can tell, this is the first time that Moses has ever worshiped. Because when you see God for who he really is, you will immediately worship. You won't, you won't worship him because it's the right thing to do. You won't worship him because you're trying to earn brownie points with God. You won't worship him because you think if you do something good, he'll do something good for, for you. You'll worship him because you are in awe of him, because you understand and you would love him. Our worship is based totally on our concept of God. If you don't know God, you're not gonna worship God. A lot of times we wonder, why don't people worship? Well, they don't know God. If you know him, you'll worship him, and it's based on who you believe God is. You see God for who he really is, and you wanna worship him. That's different about you. Here's the second thing that happened to Moses. His value of himself. I, I put, you put in your blank self-worth. Is that what I put on the slide? Yeah. Because they'll all start with S, and that's the way preachers like to do a lot of times. We think it helps you remember better. It's called an alliteration. However, I don't really think it helps you remember well. I just do it because I've been doing it for 50 years. His self-worth has changed. The way he looks at himself, his value of himself has changed because now he knows God. Look at, look at verse nine. Next verse after one we just read. And then Moses said, if now I have found grace in your sight, O Lord, let my Lord, I pray, go among us, even though we are a stiff-necked people, and pardon our iniquity and our sin, and look at this last line, and take us as your inheritance. Now, <laughs> before, Moses wanted to kill everybody. Moses was as angry as God is about sin and the people dancing around a calf and having an orgy and blah, blah, blah. Moses understands God's reluctance to go. We're a stiff-necked people, and I understand why you don't go. We're not worth your effort, God. But when Moses sees God for who he really is, Moses said, God, you've got to go with us. You've got to forgive us, God. And look, I know we're a stiff-necked people, but we're your treasure. We're your inheritance, God. <laughs> we may be the booby prize, but we're your prize, God. I mean, Moses' whole concept of himself changed <laughs> because, because he saw God as he is, and God receive us as your inheritance. See, your value of yourself will change dramatically 
when you see God for who he really is. Everything in our, and I don't have enough negative adjectives to describe the world we're living in, delusional, reprobate, evil, wicked, you name it. And that our society, our children and our generations are being taught that they are not a unique creation of a benevolent, creative God, but that they are some kind of accident of evolution floating through life like some blob of, 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 of cells going to an uncertain future. And that nothing is sacred, that you're not created in the image of God, that your life is not valuable, so they just take it uh, uh, without any reluctance, even their own lives. They don't even care about themselves, much less anybody else, because if life is not sacred and we're not created in the image of God, why should we value it? So if you teach people that, this is what you're going to get. But when you see God for who he really is, you will see yourself reflected through God's eyes. And you will see that you are a unique soul, that you are created in the image of Almighty God, that he blew life into you and he has a purpose for you and you are sacred to God. And every life is sacred to God. So your worth, your value, your concept of yourself and those around you will elevate. You're just not a, a blob of flesh. You're made in the image of God. And it'll change everything about the way you look at yourself. Here's the last thing. His witness has changed. You know, God wants us to be witnesses in this world. The Great Commission is go ye into all the world and preach the gospel, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, and lo, I'm with you even until the end of the world. I mean, we're called salt and light. We're called, uh, we're called to be a, a, a candlestick lit on a hillside, not covered up with a bushel basket. We're to reflect something about him. But if we don't know him, then we have nothing to reflect. But once we know God as he really is, whew, everything changes. Let me show you. Same chapter, Exodus 34, verse 29. Now it was so when Moses came down from Mount Sinai and the two tablets of the testimony were in Moses' hands when he came down from the mountain. This is the second time, by the way. The first time is in those verses in between, <laughs> verse 9 and verse 29. This is the second time. And the tablets of stone were in Moses' hand when he came down from the mountain. Look at this. That Moses did not know that the skin of his face shone while he talked with them. In other words, when Moses came down the mountain the second time, his face was lit up with the glory of God so brightly that the people couldn't even look at Moses. It was like, Moses, come on, man. And Moses had to put a rag over his face so that the people could even be in his presence. Now, it didn't take long to lose the glory once he got down there with those stiff-necked people and he could take the rag off. But when he came down off the mountain, he was shining with the glory of God. And I'm just going to remind you, look, the first, Moses has already been up the mountain one time, and he stayed up there 40 days, and he came down off the mountain. So he's already been up one time, came back one time. His face didn't glow the first time he came back. You know why? He didn't know God. He had just gotten the commandments from God spent some time with God, it wasn't until he broke the commandments and went back up the mountain that he said, show me your glory. I'm obviously missing something, God. And then God let his goodness pass. And this time when Moses walked down off the mountain and he knew God, his face was shining with the glory of God. I'm just saying, when God, when you see God 
as he really is, it changes the way your witness appears to this world. And God wants us to know. This is why he tells us this stuff. Because he wants us to know this and reflect this. And remember, it's the goodness of God that calls people to repentance. The Bible says we love him because he first loved us. It's not judgment that makes people want God. It's the goodness of God that makes them want God. And we are to reflect that. If you know God, this is what you reflect in life. Now, not that we're perfect and that we're always gonna get it right, but this is our effort. This is what we shoot for. This is what, what we, we, we seek to reflect, these seven attributes of the goodness of God. All right, bow your head with me one moment, would you please?